Great. Hi again. Welcome, everybody. Uh, just a quick warning before we get started that there are images in this presentation um, taken from a project about uh, the Holocaust. Not anything um, gruesome, but just images of, of places and, and settings. So just something to keep in mind. Um, so, uh, as composers and audio designers, there's this goal that I think a lot of us share, even if it's sort of hidden deep down in there somewhere, uh, which is to reach your player's emotions and affect those emotions, um, make the player feel more than they thought they could or more than they thought they were going to. Um, I love this goal. Uh, it makes me want to be in this industry more than like any other thing. Um, and to me, it's not just about, about making people feel feelings, it's about doing it as much as possible without distracting the player and making them forget uh, where they are. Uh, so we want to connect with the player, of course, um, and keep them connected, but um, ideally we also want to sort of politely lead them into some sort of like unfamiliar and hopefully interesting uh, territory. Uh, but I should back up to the connecting part. Uh, if you want players to truly give themselves to a story and to an environment or to any kind of experience um, in VR, you need to help them feel immersed and, and present and all that, and nothing will, will kill that buzz, nothing will break that connection, quite like like a road mod limiter, just like somewhere in your scene that um, you're not expecting. Yeah, so. This will be a lot of this. Yeah. Our first responsibility is to try to make the audience believe that what they are hearing is real. So we have to start with presenting and giving them the sense of where and where they are. Right, and so like on top of that, as if that weren't like enough responsibility already, we want to sort of take them on some sort of emotional journey. Uh, so this talk is not about science. Uh, it is about smoke and mirrors. Um, we are here to share some of our discoveries with you so that when you're designing your life-changing um, VR immersive soundscape, uh, you can skip straight to the good part. All right, so let's do a little bit self introduction about ourselves. Uh, I'm Larry, I'm the audio director at Contrast Studio and it's a company focusing on making VR and AR content, and I've been working on VR for four years. We'll be on more of this. Um, I'm the composer and audio designer, and formerly the audio lead at the studio called DreamSoul Games until it very sadly closed uh, earlier this year. But uh, at DreamSoul, we worked on a, a bunch of prototypes in VR, uh, sort of before committing to this one game called VR, the project, which lives on, lives on Steam uh, in the form of like a vertical slice. But during that prototyping time, I became interested in the creative potential for uh, particularly music in VR, um, playing VR games and the prospect of sort of getting away from stereo uh, particularly intrigued me because like as soon as you start using you know, spatialized monomers, the player controls the mix. And I found that really just humbling and inspiring um, because also the creative options are now, as, as uh, Will was saying before, uh, just totally limitless. So your decision about where to place emitters goes hand in hand with what kind of music you're writing. Um, all those things have to be sort of considered simultaneously. Um, I love that idea, that's sort of the impulse for this talk. Um, so, who are you? You are probably composers and or uh, audio designers, uh, because you are here, uh, but you might need a new image to be uh, otherwise curious how like dramatically the plugins and techniques have changed since like you started your project like a week ago or something. The answer is probably not a fair amount. Um, you might be an audio lead in a position to make a case for a certain plugin or technique. Uh, as you probably know, the earlier in your process that you can do that, uh, the, the easier everybody's lives will be. Um, if you're an audio programmer, like bless you, custom tools are like often the best tools. Hopefully from this you can get some insight into uh, what the more widely accessible plugins are, are up to right now and uh, what techniques you might want to build your tools to uh, accommodate. Um, so these are some of the basic terms we'll be using. Um, I bet if you're in this track, uh, you are very familiar with these, some of these things. Uh, it's totally fine if not, but we're going to skip talking about them because like a, certainly a good Google um, can do better than, than these, I think. Uh, but here they are, of particular importance. Uh, it's not that good music without Tim Mary from my boy idea of happening. Um, uh, it's not from a, a radio or a jukebox, it's just magically occurring around you. Uh, 
So we thought we could start by addressing some of the challenges that we face that I feel are unique to VR. And yeah, like, back a look. So audio is quite important in many forms of storytelling. George Lucas once said that oh, sound is half of experience, which is even more true when it comes to virtual reality because in VR, audio can directly affect immersions of experience. Uh, for example, if I uh, pick up this bottle in VR and drop it on the ground, and it, the process doesn't create any sound or the sound doesn't match our expectation, immediately our brain will let us know that there's something wrong with this world because it doesn't match our expectation in terms of the audio experience in our reality. And there's a quote from Mana Duwani, she said, uh, the purpose of virtual reality is to create an alternative reality, but without the proper audio cue to match with the visual, our brain won't buy into the illusion. So we have to make sure the audio is intuitive enough that will, dis that will not disconnect the audience from the living that virtual world. Right, and with all that in mind, there's also this challenge that I've been looking at as regards non-digit music, so like scoring. Um, which is that a number of VR games uh, use non-spatialized stereo for, for non digit music, uh, which just does not respond to head tracking and can, uh, emphasis on can, doesn't noise, uh, but can get in the way of uh, spatialized sound design. Um, so sometimes and often it's totally fine, um, and depending on your situation, it's the most appropriate thing to do. Uh, but as soon as the audio field gets too crowded, uh, which it did in the title that, that I worked on, um, your brain just starts to naturally lump all that information into this category of like miscellaneous noise, right? So it's as if you just all of a sudden, you don't want to pay attention to everything that's, that's going on. And so any chance that you had at sort of some subtle emotional tug or whatever is just instantly wiped out. Uh, so it can be good to spatialize music uh, in VR if just for the sake of balance, uh, just like you balance tracks in the mix. But once you do decide to spatialize music uh, emitters, obviously have to decide how to do that uh, so that whatever is emitting music is not drawing attention to where it is or uh, even the fact that it exists uh, at all. So next we'll share a little bit about the projects that we've done uh, in which we wrestle with, with all of these things. So the first project I'm going to introduce is called the Price of Freedom. It's a VR interactive narrative experience uh, with the backgrounds of the project MK Ultra back in 60. So there's the time where the CIA is trying to capture innocent people and brainwash them to do, them to do terrible things. And in this experience, you'll explore its, uh, the environment to figure out clues and the story itself. And let's focus on the audio part of this project. Um, so in interactive media, there are four important audio elements, which are sound effects, ambient sound, dialogue, and music. But how are we going to prioritize making them and how are we going to place them in VR? So personally, I put sound design first. I just uh, design the sound design and put it into the uh, prototype as early as possible to, to spike potential problems and work on modification based on that. And then I will create the audio space uh, for the ambient sound. So just creating the, the sense of the existence of the, the environment. And then I put on the dialogue, just putting stories and just like the context of things and that will leave me space for the, the music part. So I will know how much space do I still have for the music. And in this project particularly, I introduced uh, theme music with both diegetic and non diegetic form. Uh, theme music is a great way to remind the audience of certain characters and certain scenes of the stories. Uh, for example, uh, I designed uh, theme music for a character Kathy. Um, it, the first time it shows up is in a diagenic form, which is a music box that in space and the audience or the player can actually interact with it. And in the later half of the experience, when the story or the narrative is about this character, the same melody language shows up just reminding the audience of this character. And I designed the non diagenic form with uh, the stereo uh, music just stuck into the player's head just because it fits to the narrative. At this moment, the play is pretty much just hypnotized, so the music is like playing inside your head. Uh, and so like, oh, nice. so like introducing it in like a diegetic way first sort of made it easier for you later to sneak it in under the radar yeah. and in a non-diegetic way. Um, so uh, some more about non-diegetic music. Uh, <laughs> non-diegetic music in VR is like a particularly vast creative frontier where all your Musical dreams can, can come true as long as you hide your emitters well. So uh, these are some of the ways that, uh, that we've tried of doing that. 
Uh, the first trick is just sort of what I call Larry style, convincing the player that the music um, is in your head, uh, in which case you can definitely get away with, with stereo and have it be non-responsive to head tracking. Uh, this could happen in any number of ways, depending on your narrative. I think another example would be like, um, I've messed around with it before, like having the player physically put on um, like virtual headphones or a headset of some sort um, to sort of uh, like broadcast the sensation uh, that you're wearing headphones. It's super sneaky. I think the last time I saw that was this game, um, Virtual Virtual Reality, which is a lot of fun. Um, model audio, audio sources that follow you. Uh, look up this talk by this guy Tom Smerdin from, from the Oculus team. That's at the, I think, the 2015 uh, Oculus Connect. Uh, he details something called the Compass System. So it involves uh, emitters like fixed to your position, uh, but locked in cardinal directions. So uh, it, it's pretty elegant, I think. The, in the game, there's this like talking robot assistant right next to you, uh, whose VO, you can like, hear her like super clearly. It's very well spatialized. Um, and could just like totally be confirmation bias here, but I'm convinced that that's because the music is out of the way. Um, the other, another good one is mono sources sort of far enough back, uh, or like up in the sky, or hidden behind um, geographical landmarks or whatever. Um, and that can work really well with, with reverb. Uh, the up in the sky thing, I think, is like sort of pretty unexplored creative territory for the right project. Uh, a couple years ago, I heard um, Michael Frost, this composer, um, in one of those rooms over there, uh, talk about this game, Edge of Nowhere, and how they tried placing emitters in, in the uh, scene. Um, and I think I remember him saying they went <laughs> with another approach, but I'd be curious to hear something like that again because of how good all these plugins have come have become in the past like, few years or so. Um, and then, of course, there's all the possibilities that Will opened up for us in the first part of this talk. Um, once you uh, once you can uh, make these emitters seem abstract enough, and seem their location seem abstract enough, uh, you'd be surprised how easy it is to um, to be subtle with them, and how many, how much easier it is to uh, incorporate scoring without having the player look for anything in particular. Um, so, a side note about all of these methods is that a big part, at least for me, of the smoke and mirrors was obsessively tweaking uh, attenuations. Uh, and reverb um, that is like a reverb that is specific to the space and tweaking attenuations of all these mono emitters. Um, for me, those two things can make any implementation sound convincing. Uh, and it's how so much of the good stereo non-diegetic non music in VR uh, is good, I think. Uh, so that said, like in theory, a really elegantly designed mono emitter system uh, could be an even better like default tool than stereo if all an audio designer wants to do is sort of drop in some stems and not, not worry too much about it. Um, I should say that also like high dynamic range uh, mixing, priori priority based uh, mixing systems um, could help make all of that extra smooth, uh, but that's sort of dangerous, right? It would sort of have to be obsessively tweaked because uh, one moment, just one moment where the music pokes out more than it should can ruin all of that immersion ruin your ability to mess with feelings and all that stuff. So there are plenty of things that we haven't tried, unanswered questions about uh, music and PR in general. Um, so if you've tried something that we haven't mentioned, um, let's talk about it. We can save it for the last five minutes. Um, we can work on the same group outside. We would really love to hear what you have in mind. Um, this is the project that I worked on. What I did was similar to the Compass system that I mentioned from uh, from Farlands, which was that game, by the way, in case we didn't say the title before. Um, and you're in a project, you're in this giant mech, and you're being attacked on all sides, and some voiceover is guiding you uh, through the experience, and also you're in this um, giant city sandbox uh, that you're supposed to not break, but you know, one thing leads to another. Um, so there's like a there's a lot happening. Uh, I first tried like one ambisonic thing for music, uh, just because I thought it could be out of the way, but I think what didn't work about that, so I stitched together an ambisonic mix from other pre-recorded material, and it seems like that's just really hard to get good results out of as compared with like recording live instruments with a good Tetra mic um, or whatever. Uh, what we ended up doing was a uh, system of six emitters, uh, so one in each of the cardinal directions, and then one sort of like up here, and then one sort of like down here, like behind your butt, and like a little bit behind you. Uh, 
And I think that worked, worked really well. I ended up um, splitting up instruments across multiple emitters uh, just by sort of their frequency profile. Uh, but it tended to be that like, uh, not drums, rhythm <laughs> was sort of in these down here, sort of the stick. Uh, and uh, up here were sort of like lead instruments, sort of like a carrot. And so that drove you forward, um, which was the best way to get through this experience. Uh, so <coughs> on top of that, I added one musical layer. So it's 12 stems uh, total uh, between two layers. Uh, and that was about as much as I could do and have it remain subtle and not uh, just like, uh, not have the interacti interactivity of it just sort of poke out uh, to you. So I think it turned out okay. Soundscape is like still a little busy, but um, uh, there was a, a lot of side chaining and ducking helped with that as well. So uh, this is a summary of the techniques we've, we've sort of encountered. Uh, the more uh, abstract the overall experience, the more you can sneak in. Uh, lower frequencies are, are easy to hide, uh, easier to hide. Um, synths are good because organic sounds, as you may have learned from, from the beginning of this track, uh, spatialize uh, really well. And that means you can't hide them as easily. So synths help there. Um, it's helpful to get rhythm from non-drum instruments, because uh, drums often have very sort of crispy transients uh, that are good for spatializers, bad for subtlety. Um, pads are subtle and therefore good. I'm going to leave this up for just one more minute. Cool. Um, all, right. all right, so the next project I'm going to introduce is called Journey to the Camp. It is a VR documentary with the topic of Holocaust in the Jewish concentration camp. So um, using photorealistic computer animation, the audience, or uh, the experience will take the audience to different significant places of the camp, including the train, the shower room, uh, barrack and family uh, crematoriums, and bear them witness the survivor's memory with their voiceover recordings. And the result was the guests or the audience will see and feel how it feels like traveling through those camps. The uh, music part of this is extremely challenging, along with other documentary VR experiences, I believe, um, because we want the audience get into this experience that the environments of Holocaust themselves have its uh, their own uh, characters and energy that can ground the histories of more physicalities and understanding without further decorations or uh, emotional elaboration. So we carefully separate the experience into two parts. One stays in a realistic space while the other is taking place in an abstract space. In those one that takes in place in the realistic space, we only use the uh, um, itself to tell the story, just because staying true is considered to be the most important things we want the audience to receive from those scenes. And the only music cue shows up at the very end of the experience, where uh, the scene has changed from the realistic space into an abstract one. That there are lots of like survivors' pictures showing up in, uh, around the space, and at this moment. We feel like it's more appropriate for us to have some musical elaboration since it's in an abstract space of imaginary, that imaginary space of the memories. Um, it happens inside the audience head. And it's more, it makes more sense to have music out of nowhere inside your head than having music out of nowhere in a physical place. Right, and uh, I wanted to mention before that you know, to segue into this, a lot of the sort of like techniques and best practices we, we mentioned um, are like really heavily featured in, in this project if you have a chance to check it out. Um, so hopefully you have a sense of sort of how careful your, your musical approach has to be and how the degree of abstraction uh, has a lot to do with how you make compositional choices, uh, which again, I just think is like the most exciting uh, challenge. It's like there's just not enough, um, you know, as if we didn't have enough to do already. Um, so of course, uh, you know, a big part of how uh, the player perceives all this audio comes down to plugins. Uh, before we dive in, I just want to present some of the like bajillion uh, caveats and, and asterisks. Uh, before uh, you start a project, I would just advise that you ask yourself these questions. Uh, and at least have some sort of like proto answer, especially that, uh, that last one, I think is relevant to music specifically. Um, it's really important to have a sense of how abstract um, your environment is, because it makes a big difference as we were talking about. Um, 
and we're sort of entering the opinion zone here. So your perspective, is, like mine is subjective, could be totally different, um, and that's great. This is my test scene, this is my sort of androgynous player character there. Uh, let's see. So this is a quick rundown of where we're at with these plugins, because my testing is like still ongoing, and if you want more specifics, of course, we can talk. Uh, so here are a bunch of version numbers you can read. These are the tools that I use to test. Um, and the most recent integrations for all these as of like uh, early September. Uh, so one note is, is Oculus 1.27.0, which is one release behind the current release. Uh, the latest allows you to separate out uh, early reflections and, and late reverb um, and tweak them separately, which could have huge ramifications on a lot of those uh, techniques we were talking about before. Uh, last time I tested Unity versus Unreal, I didn't notice any real significant differences. I'm hoping to do that again soon. Um, everything is compatible with everything, which is awesome, except for Steam Audio and Wise. It says coming soon on their website. Um, I don't know how soon soon is, but there are plenty of wise, wise and kind wise people here at this conference that you can ask. Um, a lot of these findings are similar to those in an awesome post on this blog called Designing Sound by this person, Chris Lane, whom I've never met. Uh, he goes into painstaking detail. Uh, that was out in March, but it remains mostly true, so my testing has sort of confirmed a lot of it. Um, I just have some maybe sort of different opinions. Uh, I'm talking about the plugins that are free to use in your app, so not including all sorts of great third-party uh, offerings, uh, Vibes, brand new, like 3DSP, uh, Deer VR, which I think is notable for making you like a real nice testing environment. Um, Real Space 3D, it's the first one of these I've ever, I've ever used. They're wonderful people, they're at this conference. Uh, I met them at this conference. Um, G Audio Craft, which I'm sure is also good. Uh, Magic Leap is a proprietary spatializer, I think that also seems good. Um, also, Wise's 2018 uh, suite, fantastic suite of spatial audio tools. Um, and these plugins are not mutually exclusive. Uh, so, yeah, I'm thinking of this like Socrates thing that comes, it's like about like. Wisdom comes from knowing you know nothing, um, in which case, I'm great at the shape. So, uh, they all do work, uh, just like sort of dragging and dropping into your project, meaning that they all have the sensation of not just like mere panning, uh, but things sounding different in different ears. Uh, and they are all now at a point where uh, turning your head to hear things differently is pretty smooth. Uh, and that's just like the plugins directly in Unity, so be careful about integrating them with middleware. Um, it just sort of changes everything. Uh, Steam Audio has no special consideration for near field things. Uh, that's okay. Uh, resonance, uh, without doing any tweaking, uh, very fast near things are marginally smoother, I think, with just dragging and dropping it into your project. Uh, but I still find uh, Oculus's general near field audio simulation to feel uh, like the most realistic, I guess, if that's what you're going for. So again, without tweaking any uh, attenuation, uh, I also like Oculus and Nearfield uh, Spatialization because there's this corresponding like sense of heaviness, something, a sense of weight, um, when you feel something is close to you and at your, at your side. Um, I think that has to do with like how loudly the sound reaches the opposite ear. Uh, so uh, Steam Audio, I couldn't find a way to drop in an ambisonic file natively, but like FMOD, uh, which is compatible, knows what to do with it, seems to work. Um, yeah, this gets at the general point again that any middleware that ain't messing around you do sort of increases the amount of variables in this exper experiment like a bajillion fold. Uh, so uh, Oculus and Steam feature their own uh, attenuation curves by default that I think you can mess around with if you sort of peek under the hood um, if they're implemented natively. Uh, or if you mess with the attenuation in Wise or FMOD or other middleware. Uh, but if you don't want a uh, default attenuation solution, focus on like realism first and foremost. Uh, or, uh, sorry, if you do want that, uh, these are these are good choices. Um, resonance just uses sort of what, whatever attenuation you apply to it, uh, which means that uh, it might be overall maybe a better starting point for like sort of creative or abstract uh, implementation choices. Um, Steam Audio uh, is also unique in the sense that it models uh, air absorption like over long di distances, the way air absorbs uh, sound. Found this great for hiding emitters like really far away, but then you do feel like they're very far away. 
Um, again, maybe best for abstract experiences as far as music uh, is concerned. Um, I'm actually going to skip occlusion because it's not really all that relevant for music specifically, at least for me. Um, but if you want to know more about what testing has revealed, uh, I'm happy to talk about it. So, in conclusion, they're all good. It's fine. <laughs> uh, I use Oculus and Wise um, myself. Uh, I tweaked attenuation uh, for, for um, the IOTA project uh, a lot, uh, but I've since just sort of subbed in resonance with those same emitters and found the experience to be, I think, even smoother, if sort of less specific, um, which is good to keep in mind for creative applications um, like the ones I was giving you. Out of the box, using <coughs> default settings, I think for realism, Oculus and Steam are good choices, depending on how important occlusion is uh, to you, because they have different ways of going about it. Um, and resonance uh, for sort of creative applications. Final, last caveat is that this for me personally could have done something wrong, or could have ignored one of the million ways to tweak all those settings. Um, so that's our talk. <coughs> the crux of this is that trying to score a VR experience is hard, but also uh, Fascinating creative challenge. I think we could all benefit from. Um, imagine writing like this beautiful, challenging, organic orchestral score for, for VR, recording it with like a million amazing microphones, and then essentially leaving like the levels on those faders on those channels like up to chance, or even worse, up to like another human being that could purposefully like test the limits of uh, your mix. That's what we're all doing when we make things for, for VR. So the good news is that I think that sense of humility can sort of free you up to try weird and, and new things, uh, see how far you can push those boundaries without calling too much attention uh, to the emitters themselves. And uh, all that extra immersion that good spatial audio provides, like think about how much more emotionally impactful your music uh, can be than with traditional stereo or like a simple positional um, panel. That's what I think gets us excited about making music for this media. I hope you will all feel the same way as you start your next VR project. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.